Good afternoon. Uh, before we go to uh, portfolio questions, can I just say to our security guards, that if it gets too warm in here, please feel free to remove your jackets. Question number one, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to build on cultural links with Ireland. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, I visited Ireland in May this year to further strengthen our common cultural and heritage links with Ireland. At the New Grange uh, Neolithic tomb, I announced the discovery of a skeleton in East Lothian that Dr Alex Wolfe, the University of St Andrews, has advised may be Olaf Guthrusson, a 10th century king of Dublin and Northumbria. Historic Scotland are collaborating with colleagues in Ireland, for example, on a seminar at Edinburgh Castle in autumn of this year in the prestigious European Association of Archaeologists Conference in Glasgow in September 2015. I also visited uh, Dublin's Abbey Theatre and later met the Chairman um, Brian McMahon. I also met Jimmy Dinehan, the Minister of Arts, Heritage and the Gaeltacht, who hosted our joint event at the Stoll Writers Week, celebrating the writers Maurice Walsh and Neil Gunn. And I look forward to welcoming Mr Dinehan for a reciprocal event at the Edinburgh International Book Festival on the 13th of August. Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome her comments on the role the University of St Andrews played in the archaeological find. Can she advise what lessons can be learned from Ireland's approach to culture, particularly perhaps in relation to broadcasting? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think on broadcasting, it is very interesting if you look at uh, Ireland's experience. Their national broadcaster, RTE, supports broader culture, uh, providing, for example, two orchestras, two choirs and a string quartet. Uh, that, of course, is on top of delivering four television channels, four national radio stations broadcast over the spectrum and a further five digital radio stations. Uh, together with digital services such as the RT website and the RT player. Their budget is around £286 million, uh, which of course is smaller than Scotland's current licence fee resources of some £320 million. Question number two, in the name of Mary Fee has not been lodged, the member has provided an explanation. Question three, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the implications would be for the common travel area of an independent Scotland. Minister Hamza Yousaf. Scotland would remain a part of the common travel area, uh, but as an independent country in its own right, as noted in Scotland's future, it will be in the overriding interest of the rest of the UK and Ireland uh, for Scotland to remain in the common travel area. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, while supporting fresh talent, as introduced by Jack McConnell and any other similar immigration variations, is it not the case that membership of the common travel area and the absence of border checks is incompatible with a significantly different immigration policy? If the Minister doubts that, will he consult the Republic of Ireland Government about the operation of the common travel area? Minister. Well, what I'll do on that exact point is read a quote from the Irish Department of Justice spokesman in January of this year. The common travel area in no way, the common travel area in no way alters our control over immigration or visa matters and who can and cannot enter or reside in Ireland. So my suggestion is, as much as we will discuss, of course, uh, in due course with the Irish government, I suggest Malcolm Chisholm does the same. Question number four, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Dundee City Council regarding taking forward some of the plans in the Dundee City of Culture 2017 bid. Cabinet Secretary. I met with Dundee City Council on the 9th of January to discuss Dundee City Council's plans uh, for its City of Culture bid. Uh, I was delighted to hear about the Council's plans to develop a new 10-year uh, cultural strategy and since then the Council has had a series of meetings with a range of officials and partners to progress their plans. Uh, Dundee is on a pioneering journey that embraces culture and creativity to promote regeneration and to tackle wider social issues in a range of innovative ways. Jenny Mara. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for her answer. When the Inverness bid for City of Culture failed in, tw in 2007, at that point the Scottish Government stepped in and committed a substantial amount of money to ensure that some of the events would go ahead. Dundee City Council have said that some events will go ahead. Can she tell me which events will be going ahead as a result of her meeting on the 9th of January? And can, can she tell me how much money she will commit to make that happen? And the Secretary. Well, quite clearly, uh, decisions about what will go ahead in Dundee is, that, is actually for the Council in Dundee to, uh, with its partners to determine as to what should go ahead. But I can say I have been absolutely committed to Dundee in terms of its cultural progression and in terms of the activities that can take place. Um, I have already spoken to our national collections and our companies, also to Creative Scotland and Events Scotland, the whole series of events where funding comes from um, those organisations to take the plans forward. There are many uh, very good uh, programmes 
and initiatives that can still carry, carry forward. But I can tell the member, in terms of investment in Dundee, 125,000 uh, from the Scottish Government to the Aspire programme, uh, which again is using dance, drama and music uh, for the, the young people of Dundee, again part of the culture bid uh, going forward. Uh, in terms of the different plans, uh, of course the V&A support, which is extensive. Um, in terms of the funding, uh, also in relation to the different organisations, Dundee Contemporary Arts, 580,000, Dundee Repertory Theatre, £1 million over, and Scottish Dance Theatre, 800,000. Very strong programmes that currently exist. If you add on top the commitments from Creative Scotland, Event Scotland, and all the different companies, and indeed the collections in their support from Dundee, Dundee probably, compared to any other city, has the vibrant uh, initiative and vision led by SNP-led Dundee Council, but support from all our partners. That's what national government does. It brings everyone together and that's what we are delivering for the people of Dundee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question number five, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask Scottish Government what importance it places on using traditional music to promote Scottish culture around the world. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government places great importance on the promotion of Scottish culture around the world and traditional music plays a key part in our work. Uh, the Scottish Government supports the traditional music sector through Creative Scotland, which disperses more than £2 million each year to organisations, individuals and festivals that directly uh, form part of the sector. Uh, by supporting events such as Celtic Connections, Creative Scotland enables artists and musicians to promote their work internationally. And in, in addition, Creative Scotland supports Showcase Scotland. As a result of performing at Showcase Scotland. Scottish artists are, for example, appearing at the Jodhpur Rajasthan International Folk Festival in India this October. Rob Gibson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, Scottish Government has been giving an international showcase itself at major world events for Scottish musicians, such as uh, traditional musician Julie Fowlis and classical musician Nicola Benedetti at the official handover of the Ryder Cup in Chicago in 2012. Can the Minister, can the Cabinet Secretary explain how the agencies such as Visit Scotland, SDI and the British Council, which work in partnership to promote uh, Scotland abroad as a distinctive creative nation connected to the world uh, in uh, Creative Scotland's uh, 2014 plan intends? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, this year, Creative Scotland will be publishing their international strategy and they will be working with the British Council, Visit Scotland and SDI um, in developing that. Um, a very uh, notable partnership that uh, is very important is the Scotland and Venice uh, Visual Art Showcase at the Venice Biennale. That is a partnership between Creative Scotland, British Council Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government and the National Galleries of Scotland. But I think also in promoting Scotland internationally, we're looking forward uh, beyond the year of homecoming to future years, uh, themed years, including that of our architecture and design and visit Scotland in terms of promotion will also work with that but I also note the members keen interest in promoting uh, traditional music in particular and that's very much part and parcel um, of the, the promotions that we deliver uh, and I'm very excited about the connections that are being made. Question number six, Margaret McCulloch. To ask the Scottish Government what the set-up costs of an international development agency would be in the event of independence. Minister. The Scottish Government has undertaken a range of work to prepare for the transition to independence and our approach is set out in Scotland's future, pages 343 to 350, explain that a number of factors will influence the size of that one-off investment that Scotland can make in terms of, uh, would have to make in terms of transition to independence. Factors that include, for example, negotiations that would take place between the two governments and as this government has continued to reiterate over the last year and a half, if not longer, that actually we are prepared for those discussions right now, if only the UK government would come to the table. Margaret McCulloch. How does the Minister respond to concerns that the set-up, running and transaction costs of a new international development agency could detract from aid spending and lead to aid fragmentation? Surely development jobs in Scotland and UK aid spending as a whole is better protected through pooling resources to administer the world's second biggest aid budget, not just from Whitehall, but also from DFID's offices in East Kilbride. Minister. Well, I think the question is completely the wrong tone. I've said to other UK government ministers that have tried to use the poorest people in the world as a political football, that it's a very unwise move indeed. That we have given a guarantee in Scotland's future that if there are any aid projects that might possibly be affected by the transition, then we will actually take care of that cost. And it's this government, this Scottish government, not the UK government, 
that has said that they will enshrine in law that 0.7% commitment to the world's poorest. If she has any influence over her colleagues, who were in government, of course, for 13 years and never met that pledge once, then I would ask her to do that if they can. Annabel Goldie. <clears throat> With great pride, my colleagues in government, of course, have done just that. Um, the International Development Agency of an Independent Scotland cannot replicate everything the UK currently does in relation to external affairs. What would the International Development Agency of an Independent Scotland not do? Minister. No, actually, I think that's absolutely incorrect. It's not about what countries necessarily you're, and how many countries you're working in, it's how much impact you have. Uh, and yes, uh, we've said that we work currently in seven countries, and we look not to work in too many more countries, uh, but actually the impact of what we do with a small budget of £9 million pounds and £3 million pounds with climate justice is world-renowned. We've had Ban Ki-moon, uh, UN Secretary-General, we've had Desmond Tutu, we've had former Irish President Mary Robinson commend the work that the Scottish Government does with the limited resource that we have. So my appeal would be to Annabel Goldie uh, that actually she should have more ambition for our country uh, in any department in government, but particularly in the ambition that we've shown already in helping the world's poorest. <coughs> Question number seven, Paul Martin. <coughs> uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of the budget of independence and funding available to creative organisations through the Big Lottery Fund. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, following Independence, Scotland will continue to receive a fair share of the national lottery ticket sales to support good causes, including the work of creative organisations. In Independence, Scotland, all decisions about the distribution of good cause money will be made in Scotland to ensure that the needs of local communities are met. The Big Lottery Fund in Scotland supports communities and the third sector, and its role in relation to creative or cultural organisations is limited to the projects that deliver community benefits. Uh, general Arts Lottery funding, amounting to 34 £4.9 million pounds in 2014-15 is already devolved to Scotland and delivered by Creative Scotland. Paul Martin. Officer, as the Minister will be aware, allocation of funding is currently uh, via the Barnett formula. Uh, can I ask the Minister what discussions have taken place in respect of this uh, funding and uh, arrangement uh, and what other discussions she's had with the National Lottery Organisation? Well, um, at present, the, the licence to run the National Lottery is, is held by Camlet Group PLC and is in place until 2023. Um, the Scottish Government does not intend to change this arrangement, but clearly for other aspects that are more centralised, there would then be the, uh, the opportunity for Scotland to do similar to what we do with Creative Scotland in terms of the Arts and Culture Fund, is to have all the decisions about the distribution of lottery funds made in Scotland. Um, I have held meetings with Camelot. Question number eight, Drew Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has sought with consular representatives to explain its case for Scotland leaving the United Kingdom. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, ministers regularly meet members of the consular corps and discuss a range of subjects. Uh, following the launch of Scotland's Future, the Minister for External Affairs and International Development held a briefing for consular representatives in Edinburgh on the 27th of November 2013. I held similar events with diplomatic representatives in Brussels and London on the 26th and the 27th of November. Drew Smith. We know that most Scots are unconvinced by independence and the decision will, after all, be theirs. But in a week when the Swedish government have expressed concerns, the former US Secretary of State, President Obama and now the Chinese Premier, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and urge her, uh, her and the Scottish government to redouble their efforts, which are clearly having the opposite effect to that which they would intend? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I think it's quite notable, for example, in Sweden, that the Prime Minister said that we have a lot of experiences in referendums throughout Europe and we have learned to respect the results and not to um, speculate in advance. I think the point being made about uh, Premier Lee saying the re respect the choice you make, uh, also in terms of uh, Barack Obama saying, but ultimately these decisions that are made are to be made by the folks there. Now, the people who are best placed to make decisions about Scotland are those who care most about Scotland. Scotland, and that is the people who live here. And David Cameron seems more than happy to engage with every country he can about Scotland's independence, apart from in debates with the democratically elected First Minister of Scotland. And I think the people of Scotland find uh, that, that says more about the Westminster government's approach to Scotland internationally than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Question number nine, Alison Johnson ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the away aspect of its legacy 2014 Scottish Sport Relief Home and Away programme. Minister. Thank you, Member, for the question. Uh, the Scottish Government is funding uh, four pro projects in sub-Saharan Africa through the first phase of the Sports Relief 
uh, away programme. The first phase of the programme is worth a total of £2.5 million, pounds, including a Scottish contribution of £1.25 million. Now, the projects are based in Malawi, South Africa uh, and Uganda, and working to improve housing conditions uh, to support people whose lives have been affected by conflict and assist in providing education for deaf children. We are also developing a second phase of the away programme together with Sport Relief and will be making a further announcement on this in due course. Alison Johnson. Um, I, thank the, uh, I welcome the projects and the Scottish Government's support for these projects. The United Nations recognises that sport is a universal language that can be a powerful tool to promote peace, tolerance and understanding. How can the Games help to strengthen Scotland's global links and solidarity between people in Scotland and elsewhere? And will there be opportunities for children in Scotland to learn about the AWAY projects and to understand why we're supporting them? Thank Vanessa. you. Well, I think the member makes uh, an excellent point, and uh, I've seen myself through the first phase of the projects, uh, what an impact it's making, but the international development work that we're doing and the engagement through sports with some of the poorest in the world is not just being done by the government. It's great to have, for example, the SFA uh, involved in that, as well as other sporting uh, agencies. I think she makes a very, uh, very right point, very correct point, uh, that perhaps there's a lot more that we can do to reach out to children here so that they understand uh, the efforts that, that they can make in order, in order to connect with other children in the poorest parts of the world is something I'll reflect on and see how we can do, do more of. <coughs> Question number 10, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the value is of art treasures, paintings, artefacts and national treasures that it or the Scottish National Gallery holds. Cabinet uh, The Scottish Government does not hold a current valuation uh, for the works of art which it holds. The holdings comprise both loans and purchased works although there have been no purchases by the Scottish Government for at least 10 years. The National Galleries of Scotland does not have current market valuations for all of the items in the collection, which is made up of almost 100,000 works. Individual items in the National Collections are only valued when there is a requirement to do so, for example, for loans out, which will require commercial insurance. Richard Lyle. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for, the, for an answer. Can I ask Cabinet Secretary, and can she tell me what the current value of artefacts, paintings and national treasures out presently in loan from the Scottish Government or the Scottish National Gallery is at this time? Cabinet Secretary. There are no uh, artworks out on loan at present from the Scottish Government. Uh, the value of works on loan uh, to, uh, from uh, National Galleries of Scotland is currently uh, just over £1 million. Thank you. We now move to questions on infrastructural investments in cities. I'll give a few moments. Question one, Neil Bibby. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the rising co cost of rent for housing. Minister Margaret Burgess. Okay. The Scottish Government is investing in social housing at rates which help to keep rent levels low. Scottish social housing has always been based on a principle of, of affordability to tenants in low paid employment without recourse to benefits, a principle which we believe should be upheld. That is why in July 2013 the Scottish Government increased the subsidy levels for all social housing by £16,000, which enables councils and housing associations to keep social rents affordable. Also in outcome 14 of the Scottish Social Housing Charter, the Government requires social landlords to take account of what their tenants can afford when they set rents. Rent levels in the private sector are set at the market rate and will reflect local market conditions. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, under the SNP Government, housing associations have been starved of vital resources and, as a result, housing association tenants have, in actual fact, in Scotland, seen their annual rent rise by an average of £830 since the SNP came to power. When families are struggling with the cost of living, does the Minister think that that is acceptable? And in terms of the private rented sector, does the Minister accept that increasing rents are an issue in the private sector too? And will the Minister support Labour's proposal next week to cap rent rises? Minister. As I said in my initial response, the Scottish Government has increased the subsidy to social landlords to allow landlords to be able to keep rents at an affordable level um, for their tenants. In terms of the, the Labour amendment to the, the, housing, um, to the housing bill, Neil Bibby is well aware that that was a, a, a substantial um, legislation Labour 
are asking for introduced a very late stage in the bill and only after um, Ed Miliband introduced it uh, in England. It was not something that was introduced at any other stage of the bill or in any meetings we had. But what I can say is that we are taking form uh, forward reform of the private sector tenancy regime and we will be looking at rent levels as part of that consultation. James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in terms of looking at rent caps to help those in the private rented sector, I was interested to note the expert group on welfare welcomed this idea, stating, and I quote, that rent should increase in line with inflation but not above it, at least for the duration of the tenancy. Is the Minister de disagreeing with the views of her own expert group on welfare? Minister. I think I will repeat what I said earlier. We have been looking at the reform of the tenancy regime in the private rented sector. We set it up with a, a stakeholder group covering all stakeholders. They have now made recommendations to the government and we will, we will be consulting on a detailed policy proposal for a new tenancy regime in autumn. As part of it, and I will say it again, it will explore issues relating to rent levels. And that is the appropriate way to do it, is by consulting, discussing with stakeholders, receiving the evidence and the proposals and then going out in consultation and not throwing it in as a last minute thing as James Kelly is trying to do. Question number two, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the construction of the Borders Railway. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the construction of the Borders Railway remains on schedule for completion in June 2015, with passenger services available by September 2015 following a period of driver training. We do, however, continue to examine possibilities with Network Rail uh, for completion ahead of these timescales. Jim Hume. Thank the Minister for that response and welcome the project's uh, continuing progress. The Minister may be aware that it now takes an hour longer to travel from Hoyk to Edinburgh via public transport than it did in 1969. Borders Rail will deliver an undoubted economic boost along its route. The First Minister said in April that Borders Rail will act as a catalyst for the restoration of the rest of the historic Waverley route. Will the Minister commit today to commissioning a feasibility study into the extension of Borders Railway to Hoyk, at the very least, uh, to support a town which, of course, was most affected by beaching cuts? Minister. Uh, the Member is quite right to highlight the benefits which will flow from this uh, project, not least because people disconnected from the railway network for nearly 40 years will be back able to use uh, the services, which will be both frequent and moderately priced. Uh, in relation to further extensions, uh, what I would say is I think we have found it very uh, productive to concentrate on the project in hand to make sure that we get that done as quickly as possible in the, right, in the best possible way. The question which he raised about further extensions was raised last night at the cross-party group and undertook to look into that and get back to the person concerned. I am happy to copy the member into that correspondence. Mark Griffin, it is about the Borders Railway. It certainly is, uh, President Officer. The, the, as far as I understand, the First Minister has already um, committed to a feasibility study on extending that line in the future. Can the Minister say whether this would lead to um, the line being double-tracked across its whole length, and will there be significant um, engineering works to the current package if any um, extension was proposed? Minister, it was about the Borders Railway. <laughs> Indeed it was, uh, President Officer. I just say that uh, obviously part of the, the current project will be double-tracked, but it was essential to get the cost-benefit ratio which was necessary to go ahead with the project uh, to make it, uh, if you like, wash its face. Had we committed at that stage to double-tracking the entire line, it would have completely skewed the cost-benefit ratio. So further decisions on double-tracking in future it would be taken after some time after the project itself is buried in. And the same applies, as I've just uh, mentioned, in relation to possible extensions. The First Minister has mentioned that's a possibility, but we are concentrating on making sure we get this project done as quickly as possible. Question three, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the redevelopment of Stranraer Harbour waterfront. Cabinet Secretary. We are committed to supporting sustainable economic growth in Dumfries and Galloway by working closely with Scottish Enterprise and Dumfries and Galloway Council as partners in the South of Scotland Alliance. Uh, we welcome the good progress being made by Dumfries and Galloway in taking forward the work of the Stranraer Task Force with identified investment in marine and community projects. The Stranraer and East Pier design brief has been developed to guide the regeneration of the former terminal site. Together with uh, Scottish Borders Council and Scottish Enterprise, uh, Dumfries and Galloway Council is developing a rural economic development programme for the area. The redevelopment of the Stranraer waterfront is a key part of that ambitious vision for growth in the south of Scotland. Alex Ferguson. 
Um, thank you. I'm grateful to Cabinet Secretary for that response. She will be aware, I'm sure, that the site is now being tested on the open market, and obviously we all hope that that will have a successful outcome. However, if no buyer is found, will the Scottish Government, would the Scottish Government consider further direct involvement, such as the creation of an enterprise zone in Stranra, uh, to encourage the investment that is so desperately needed, not just for the uh, enhancement of the derelict waterfront itself, but also for the local economy? Well, I mean, the member, uh, I'm sure, will appreciate that I'm you know, not in a position, nor would it be appropriate to you know, give specific commitments around specific proposals about that right now. What I will say, and I hope this came through uh, from the, the spirit of the answer I gave earlier, is that the Scottish Government is very committed to working with partners uh, in Dumfries and Galloway, particularly around some of the uh, projects in Stranra that he's talking about, to find the best way forwards in terms of the regeneration of the area. So we stand ready uh, to discuss uh, with partners what the best approaches are be, uh, might be in particular circumstances. And I'm, uh, as always, happy to meet with the member to have these discussions in more detail as well, if that would be helpful. Question four, Anne McTaggart. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages the availability of affordable housing in the private rented sector. Minister, Margaret Burgess. Okay. Our housing strategy confirmed that we would support a substantial expansion of intermediate or mid-market rental properties to complement social rented housing and ease the pressures on it. We are doing this through a range of initiatives, including grant subsidy to RSL subsidiaries, the Empty Homes Loan Fund and the National Housing Trust. I'm McTaggart. I thank the Minister for that response. One in four people who rent privately live in poverty. The jo Joseph Rowntree Foundation found that private renters in Scotland spend 23% of their income on housing, up from 18% just a decade ago. In order to improve the situation of the 300,000 households who find themselves in this position. Scottish Labour has proposed a cap on rent rises and an introduction of standard, a standard three-year tenancy agreement. Why won't the Scottish Government support these measures? Minister. Um, in terms of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report, it also reported that households in Scotland um, spend a smaller share of their income in housing costs than they do in England. The same report also found that poverty rates in Scotland are also lower than 10 years in England. And I'll refer um, the member back to the answer I gave earlier. The Scottish Government is taking forward reform of the private rented sector tenancy. We'll be consulted on a, consulting on a detailed policy proposal for a new tenancy regime in autumn and part of that will explore issues relating to re rent levels. And we'll do that in taking evidence, take, consulting with our stakeholders and allowing Parliament to give detailed scrutiny to any proposals that we put forward. Question five, Annabel Goldie. To uh, ask the Scottish Government when it last met Transport Scotland and what issues were discussed. Minister Keith Brown. Yeah, Transport Scotland is part of the Scottish Government and meetings with ministers occur regularly in the normal course of business. Annabel Goldie. Presiding officer, in July 2012, the Minister for Transport announced substantial cuts to the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme. Can he confirm which improvements were removed from the programme, when phase one is due to be completed, and can he update the Parliament on a timescale for any future phases? Minister. I think the member may recall that we uh, announced at the same time that around 80% of the original works proposed for the previous budget of £1 billion should be delivered for the new uh, budgetary price. Uh, there are some program, parts of the programme which are being phased. So, for example, the Edinburgh Gateway was part of that uh, phased approach. And we expect to have it completed, the electrification itself completed by 2018. Uh, further works uh, following on which will be completed by 2019. But this is a, a very substantial investment by the government in this uh, around £850 million, pounds, which will lead to improved services between Edinburgh and Glasgow, increased number of uh, passenger uh, spaces available, and also improve the environmental costs which is incurred by rail travel. Jane Baxter. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In a response to a question last week regarding the Leave Mouth Rail Link, the Minister suggested that neither he nor Transport Scotland had had any contact from Fife Council regarding this project. As the leader of Fife Council did in fact write to the Minister on the 28th of May, and the letter was acknowledged by the Scottish Government, could the Minister now correct the record and acknowledge that representations have in fact been made by Fife Council on this matter? Minister. Of course, if that's the case, I'll do just that. But I think the question that I was asked was whether we'd have representation saying that was to be the priority of Fife Council. Uh, we had no record of any correspondence. If it's a case that something's been missed, then of course I'll write to the member and confirm that. Question number six, Jimmy McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the building of more affordable homes in the rural communities of the Highlands and Islands. Minister Margaret Burgess. 
The Scottish Government has allocated over £53 million to Highland Council and the three island authorities for the period 2012-13 to 2014-15 to build affordable homes. The Scottish Government provides higher subsidy benchmarks for rural areas and West Highland, island authorities and remote rural Argyll compared to the city and urban developments. Jamie we have McGregor. supported the Small Sorry. Communities Housing Trust Rent to Buy model, which provides affordable housing for rural communities in Highland. Jamie McGregor. Oh, I thank the Minister for that answer. As well as constructing new homes, many constituents want to see empty and dilapidated homes brought back into use for affordable rent. Is the Minister confident that the Empty Homes Loan Fund is as effective a measure as the previous Rural Empty Properties Grant Scheme, and are there any plans to expand the scope of the Empty Homes Loan Fund? Minister. Okay, the, the Empty Homes uh, Loan Fund has already approved uh, projects in the Highland and Islands, and four and a half million pounds has been offered uh, to over the £4 million originally set for the fund. Highland has 400,000 and the Western Isles have 155,000 allocated. And we are looking at the, the, the empty homes loan scheme and we're always looking and in discussion with local authorities and with stakeholders to see how we can encourage more and more um, owners to bring their properties back into use because that's something we all want. And I'm willing to engage with the member in that if he's got something you know, if we've more discussion than that one as we go forward. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2008, the Scottish Government launched the Rural Home for Rent scheme at a cost of £5 million. Can the Minister tell us how many homes were built using these funds and if any review was carried out into the scheme? Minister. I don't have the figures at hand for that, but we did run the Rural Homes for Rent scheme as a pilot project which provided grant funding to rural landlords for affordable housing uh, at the mid-market rent level. The funding could be used to re renovate empty properties or build new homes, and it was popular in some parts of Scotland. And we are aware that some people have looked for um, the reintroduction, but there were difficulties with that scheme. But if the member have any, has any specific questions on that scheme, um, is she willing to give me the questions? I will respond to them. Question number seven, Jim Meady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with cycling organisations regarding improvements to cycling infrastructure. Minister, Keith Brown. Uh, both myself and officials speak regularly to cycling organisations regarding cycling infrastructure. Uh, and the outcome of the most recent discussion was the allocation of an additional £7 million funding for cycling and walking infrastructure projects announced on the 10th of June. Also last week, in partnership with Sustrans, the Scottish Government allocated 84 Commonwealth Games legacy cycle rights to businesses across Scotland, adding an additional 840 cycle parking spaces in workplaces. Jimidi. Given the growing appetite across Scotland for cycling infrastructure that makes cycling an easy and natural choice for everyday short trips, what message does it send out to cyclists and tourists visiting Scotland that Network Rail have banned cycling from Waverley Bridge down into the station, with cyclists having to use the narrow pavements already often congested with walkers and totally unsuitable for prams, buggies and bikes to pass each other? Will the Minister take this matter up with Network Rail and ask them to urgently review this decision so as to permit safe access to the station for cyclists and much more customer-friendly signage to be established? Yeah. Minister. I think the message that it sends out is that Network Rail are very concerned about safety within the, uh, the stations which they own. I am informed by Network Rail that the decision to close both ramps to all users other than delivery vehicles has been necessary in order to create a more secure station, providing a number of benefits, including a safer interface between passengers and vehicles, as well as improving the air quality. The recently completed improvement programme has delivered new, fully accessible entrances to the station at both Carlton Road and Market Street, with additional cycle parking at the west side of the station. It is in everyone's interest that we have safe and secure access to the railway, and I am sure that Network Rail are already aware of these particular issues. In fact, I discussed it with the route manager for Network Rail last night, and I'm happy to raise uh, further raise the issues which the member has uh, uh, raised the issues which he has raised in relation to concerns about cycling access. Annabel Boldy, signing officer, can I share uh, Mr. Reid's concern? As a regular commuter, I have to say the new arrangements could not be more inconvenient, and I regard myself as reasonably able-bodied. But they now require access to taxis, for example, without any cover in times of heavy rainfall. What are elderly people or people with disabilities meant to do to cope with that? Minister. 
I think part of the issue is the fact that Waverley is relatively unique in being, uh, if you like, effectively underground. They don't have, I think, any other stations which are in that situation. And they have been very concerned to make sure that the safety of, pa uh, of passengers and people accessing the railway is paramount. We've actually had a very serious fatal accident, as you'll know, there recently in that regard. So that's, that's the background against which Network Rail have taken forward these proposals. There was access by taxis before that point, but they found out that is uh, obviously potentially dangerous, as it proved to be in the instance which I mentioned. Uh, they are further looking at this. I've had representations from Edinburgh City Council and I've raised the issues that they've raised with me on their behalf to Network Rail. But I think their, their primary interest has to be safely accessing and coming out of the railway station. And there is, of course, uh, there are two, at least two taxi ranks very close by as soon as you come out the entrance of the station as well and on two different entrances. So, as I say, I will raise these issues again with Network Rail, but I think they're doing this for the best of reasons. Question number eight, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the report below the bread line published by Oxfam, Church Action on Poverty and the Trussell Trust. Minister Margaret Burgess. The report contains some important messages showing that a combination of changes to the social security system, low wages and rising living costs are contributing significantly to food poverty. It's unacceptable that anyone in a country as prosperous as Scotland should have to rely on food banks, yet both the food aid report we published in December and the recent report from the Parliament's Welfare Reform Committee showed that benefit changes and delays are leading more and more people to turn to food banks. We are taking action to support those most in need through our million pounds emergency food action plan, but we simply can't mitigate all of the changes coming from Westminster. We need the powers of independence to help build a fairer society, including actions to address low pay and a welfare system better suited to Scotland's needs. James Donner. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does she agree with me that it is important that organisations like Oxfam and the Trussell Trust should be able to draw attention to the perfect storm that is brewing with regards to the poverty experienced by far too many people across the UK, which was also highlighted in the Scotland's Outlook campaign led by SCVO? without fear of being shut down, as is in the case of Trussell Trust, or reported to the Charities Commission, as in the case of Oxfam? Minister. Yes, I absolutely agree that organisations working in the front line uh, producing have the evidence uh, to inform all of us, and I don't think they should be under any threat of, of being closed down. But the reality is that the UK Government welfare reforms, which this Scottish Government has consistently opposed, oppose, involve punitive cuts. And that's what the, wealth, the UK government don't want to hear. So I very much agree with the member. All organisations working in the front line should have the right to speak out based on what they see day and daily in front of them and shouldn't have any uh, fear of being closed down because of it. Jackie Bailey. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary, sorry, I've just promoted you. I'm sure the Minister appreciates that an increasing number of employed people are accessing food banks. And I'm sure she would agree that we need to do more to address in-work poverty. And whilst I welcome the One Million Food Action Plan, um, I do wonder whether she regrets not introducing the living wage, because that's the power she has now. It would have made a difference to 400,000 families across Scotland. Minister. If so what I would say to the member is that if successive UK governments had increased the living wage, even in line with inflation, people in Scotland in low incomes would be £600 a year better off. But I would also say that this Scottish Government and the Deputy First Minister has made our position in the living wage absolutely clear. We have led in this in the living wage. The Scottish Government pays it to everyone across the sector that they are responsible for. We have we've supported the Poverty Alliance and funded the Poverty Alliance to promote the accreditation of living wage employers in Scotland. So nobody should have any doubt whatsoever about the position of this Scottish Government regarding the living wage. Question 9, Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Aberdeen City Council regarding transport developments. Briefly, Mr Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government has had regular discussions with Aberdeen City Council over a number of transport developments, including public transport, road and rail infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure and hydrogen infrastructure. Briefly, Mr Macdonald. Can I welcome the announcement of the preferred bidder for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route? And given that Aberdeen City Council uh, is a partner in delivering that project, can the Minister advise whether the Council is participating fully in discussions around this and the projects which will follow on from it, given the recent uh, decision by the Administration not to involve themselves in the public information events around the Hardigan Improvement Plan? Briefly, Minister. 
Uh, I can confirm that the timescales are discussed regularly and as a funding partner to the project, Aberdeen City Council participates fully in all discussions. Following my attendance at Aberdeen City Council's Finance, Policy and Resources meeting, a very constructive meeting on the 6th of May, to discuss the Scottish Government's commitment to improving Horrigan, the Council have confirmed that it will work closely with Transport Scotland as the Horrigan Improvement and Middlefield Regeneration Schemes progress to help facilitate a joint approach which best serves local residents and road users alike. Thank you. That ends uh, questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10353 in the name of Joanne Lamont on Scotland's future. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak.